Thank you, Bob. I appreciate that wonderful introduction. I get nervous when people stand up when I'm introduced because I think they're all getting up to leave. But, uh, <laughs> boy, I want to congratulate you all on what you've done. And Bob, you and Mr. Stoller and Mr. Gray, in 1983, what you people have done and the 367,000 people you got a job last year, the difference you made in people's lives, I congratulate you. I want to tell you, it's nice to be around successful people. I know you've had tremendous success. I know from the year 2002, you've gone from 800 million to almost 1.6 billion. You've gone from 402 franchises to 513. But you know the most impressive thing? You're not only successful, you're significant. The difference is, if you're successful when you die, it ends. When you're significant is when you help other people be successful. So I come here very, very humbly, and I'm not going to preach to you or lecture to you. I do understand this. It's a lot different signing the paycheck on the front than it is on the back. You know, the <laughs> people sign on the back, they got all the answers. It, and it's so great to have so many spouses here. I've said so many times, I said sincerely, if you want some great advice, listen to your spouse. Nobody knows you any better, loves you any more, wants to see you succeed any more, or cares about you any more than they do. And my wife, not only somebody I love dearly, she's my best friend. There's nobody's opinion I respect as much as my wife's. As a matter of fact, when I was at Ohio State under Woody Hayes, we won the national championship. And Ohio National Bank had a huge billboard sign that said, behind every successful person stands a very surprised mother-in-law. Boy, that's true in my case, maybe true in yours as well. But let's understand who Lou Holtz is not. I'm not a singer. I'm not a dancer, I'm not an intellect. I'm very much like Bob, I was in lower half my high school class, as a matter of fact. I'm the only person you will ever meet in this world who has written more books than he has read. <laughs> All right, so, so just understand this, a plain, simple individual here today. And I know you're sitting there saying, well, what do we have in common? Well, all my life, my job has been to build a team in order to be successful. You know, there are a lot of things in this world I don't understand. I don't understand how a black cow eats green grass, produces white milk and yellow cheese. I don't understand why they sell hot dogs in packages of 10 and hot dog buns in packages of 8. I don't understand why a sick person has to go all the way back to the pharmacy to get medicine, a healthy person can buy cigarettes at the door. I don't understand that. But what I really don't understand is how some people born with so much achieve so little, and some people born with so little achieve so much. I don't understand how some people see an obstacle and look on it as an opportunity, and somebody else sees an obstacle and immediately gets discouraged. You now, ladies and gentlemen, when I, every story I tell you is absolutely true. When I went to the University of Notre Dame, Father Joy said, Coach, before you accept this job, there are certain things that are not negotiable. Don't come here and think you're going to change Notre Dame because these things we will not change while we're here. We will not redshirt. We will not take a transfer from another school. They're going to need 16 core curriculum classes to even be considered for admission. We don't have good football facilities. We don't want to improve them because we don't want to be a football factory. And he said in addition to that, he said we're going to play the most difficult schedule we can find. We expect to compete for the national championship every two years. Don't come here and think you're going to put an easy schedule. He said, the other thing that's not negotiable, the head football coach at the University of Notre Dame is not allowed to make more than the president of the university and the presence of priest. <laughs> now, when we walked into the press conference, Father Joey said, Coach, I appreciate you wouldn't mention anything about salary. I said, oh, don't worry, Father. I'm as embarrassed about it as you are. I won't say a word. <laughs> But he didn't say a single thing that would discourage me. He didn't say anything that would keep us from being successful. Yeah, he presented some problems, he presented some obstacles, but he didn't say you can only play with seven, everybody else go and play with 11. And Father Hesburgh said to me, he said, Coach, I can name you the head football coach at Notre Dame because titles come from above. People can name you the franchise, but they cannot name you the leader. Because he said leaders will be determined from below. And who's the leader? I said, Father Esberg, what in your mind's a leader? He said, if you have a vision and you have a plan. In 1983, when Acme went bankrupt, and Bob and William and James had a vision, 
had a vision where they want to go, and only two years later they awarded their first franchise. You have to have a vision where you want to go, but it's equally important, you have to have a plan how to get there. And what I want to share with you is a plan that we use to build a team to overcome obstacles and difficulties. I've taken over six college situations, never inherited a winner, never failed to go to a bowl game by the second year at the latest. I believe in this plan. I believe in it strongly. And there's five points to the plan. It isn't real complicated. And it doesn't matter what phase of your life. But before I give you the plan, I want you to ask yourself this question. If I didn't go home, who would miss me and why? If I didn't go to work, who would miss me and why? If our organization went out of business, who would miss us and why? Because what we have to make sure is we are making a difference, that we're different than everybody else, that we have a purpose, we have a function, and we stand for something. If an airline went out of business, you wouldn't notice it because you just go fly another airline, they're all the same. But Disney went out of business, you'd miss it because it's different, it's unique, it's separate. There's nothing else like it. And what you people have done, you have made a difference in people's lives because there's nobody that's doing the job that you're doing. Now, the plan we have is five points. The first plan is the attitude you choose. And I emphasize you choose because it's a choice. And you're like me. Nobody's going to wind you up. Nobody's going to crank you up. Nobody's going to give you a pep talk in the morning. That's up to you to set the tempo and the attitude because people are going to take your attitude. Now, what's your attitude when things go wrong? Let me tell you what happened my first year at the University of South Carolina. I inherited the longest losing streak in the country. That first year, my wife had her second major cancer surgery. They gave her 10% chance to live. I'm Happy to report she's doing very well. Now, I don't pray for her anymore. I pray to her. I, I mean, she's a true saint. <laughs> but I thought we might lose her. And my son Skip went into a coma the week we played Georgia with a rare illness. My mother died the Friday before we played Florida. Man's most prized possession. This all my first year. I was on a school airplane four days recruiting. I was going to be on it two more days, and we landed at Lady Island Airport. And the pilot said, Coach, will you visit the athlete? We're going to fly 11 miles to Hilton Head to get gas, and we'll fly back and pick you up. Leave your suitcase, leave your hanging bag on the airplane. During that 11-mile flight, the school plane crashed. One school pilot was killed instantly, another one seriously injured who later died. We lost every single football game we played that year. We went on 11. And I had a kicker that said, I can't kick when you're watching. <laughs> I explained I was going to be at the games. That was part of it. <laughs> now, we were on 11 that year, but records could be deceiving. We really weren't as good as our record would lead you to believe. <laughs> And boy, you talk about being down, you got two choices, pick yourself up or you stay down, you can't count on anybody else. George ain't going to call and say, Coach, you don't have a quarterback, let me send you one. <laughs> and the news media is all over you and people are criticizing you. And that's up to you then, you got to be a leader then more than ever when things aren't going well. I can't begin to tell you how many times I get down on my knee and prayed before I went into a staff meeting that I could be courageous and brave and bring the right attitude that we're going to make it. It was hard. Hey, things like this happen to me all the time. I'm in an airport. Guy walked up to me and said, anybody tell you you look like Lou Holtz? <laughs> I said, it happens to me all the time. And he said, really makes you mad, doesn't it? <laughs> you move on. You have no other choice. And what, you don't find happiness in the environment. It's nice when... Bob introduced me, he sort of slid over the fact I signed a five-year contract with the New York Jets. I went to the New York Jets, maybe the best job in America, but I turned it down three different times because I didn't really want to leave NC State. My children were young and happy, my wife was happy, and I finally said to her, well, let's go see. If we don't like professional football, we can always come back to intercollegiate athletics. I went there with a negative attitude. Every time there's a problem, every time there's a difficulty, I said, I didn't think this would work out. I didn't think it's what I wanted to do. And we had some beautiful people there. Joe Namath was our quarterback, just a wonderful individual. But the attitude I had, and I resigned after eight months. Maybe the best job in America is miserable, unhappy, and unsuccessful. 
I regret it to this day because one of the few things I've walked away from. But if you don't have the right attitude, I don't care what situation you're in, how great the opportunity is, you're going to be too blind to see it. On the other hand, several years ago, they asked me to go to the University of Minnesota to coach. Now, Minnesota lost 17 games. The average score was 47 to 13. And they offered a job to five different people, including three assistant coaches, and one of them didn't even have a job, and all five turned it down. And a guy named Harvey McKay said, but there's great opportunity here, Lou. He said, you, you, you just have to understand how talented the people are. He said, for example, last year Nebraska beat us by 10. Well, that impressed me because Nebraska has a good program, not as good as Oklahoma, but they have a good program. Uh, what I didn't realize, Harvey meant 10 touchdowns. I, I mean, Nebraska beat us 84-13, to 13, Ohio State 68-10. to 10. They had lost 17 games. You ever score 47-13? But I took the job anyway. I didn't want to go to Minnesota because everybody I'd ever met from Minnesota had blonde hair and blue ears, so I, I didn't want to go there. <laughs> and every time I looked at the back of the USA Today, they were always in dark blue, so, but, but I went anyway. You know what, ladies and gentlemen, it's one of the great experiences I've had. Minnesota's a wonderful place to live, even though the state bird's a mosquito. And <laughs> the second year, we were in a bowl game and won it. And here's what I say to you. The New York Jets may be the best job in America. It's miserable, unhappy, unsuccessful. Minnesota, a job nobody wanted was a great experience, and we were successful. What's the difference? The attitude you approach it. Are you looking at problems, or are you looking for solutions? I could go on and on about that, ladies and gentlemen. And it affects the attitude of the people you work with. Jerome Bettis, the bus. How great it was for Jerome Bettis. But let me tell you, Jerome, this story was written up in the New York Times about two weeks ago. Jerome Bettis played for me at Notre Dame. He left Notre Dame. He was drafted in the first round. He was rookie of the year for the Los Angeles Rams. His second year wasn't very good. His third year was a disaster. Everybody said he's washed up. He was thinking about quitting the game. We had an open date at Notre Dame, and I watched the Rams play, and he didn't play good, so I called him on Monday. I said, Jerome, is Coach Oates, I saw the game, and, I, and he said, what'd you think? I said, that's why I'm calling you. I said, Jerome, I don't know where you were yesterday, but you didn't go to the game, but obviously there's somebody impersonate you, wearing your jersey, your number, your name, but he's giving you a bad reputation, but I know you'd never play that bad, but you ought to find out who it is and put a stop to it and hung the phone up. That's all I said. <laughs> Never gave him a chance to say a word. As soon as the season's over, Jerome Bettis in my office. He said, Coach, I've been thinking about that conversation. He said, when I left Notre Dame, I had a wonderful attitude. And then I got with the wrong people. And he said, my attitude digressed. He said, I'm going to spend the next five months at Notre Dame and get his attitude right. And he said, I am going to go back. During that five months, Bill Cower, the head coach of the Pittsburgh Steelers, who I coached and recruited, at the University of North Carolina State called me and said, Coach, we're thinking about trading for Jerome Bettis. What do you think? I said, I think it would be a great move. You get the same talent but a different attitude. Now Jerome's the fourth all-time leading rusher in NFL history. He'll go into the Hall of Fame. And when they were going to the Super Bowl, what did his teammates talk about? It was important for them to get Jerome to Detroit because of the attitude, the love and the admiration everybody had for him. And attitude's a choice, but it's so critical. So critical. I'm in South Carolina. One week, the phone rings. A young man said, Coach, my name's Ryan Brewer, and I want to play for you. I said, Ryan, I don't know anything about you. Tell me. He said, I'm a running back from Troy, Ohio. I'm 5'10", 185 pounds. I'm an A student, and I was player of the year in the state of Ohio. I said, if you're player of the year in the state of Ohio, Ryan, I want to coach you. He said, Coach, I was, and I want to play for you, but I need a scholarship. I said, Ryan, if what you told me is true, you have one. He said, Coach, it's absolutely true, and I accept the scholarship. And I said, that's great. <laughs> I said, that's wonderful, Ryan. Who else offers you one? He said, nobody, but I'm glad you did. <laughs> I, I said, Ohio State didn't recruit. You thought it was too small, Michigan too small. He did not have a scholarship offer. Now, when an athlete arrives on campus, first thing we do is we time him in the 40-yard dash. Now, Rocket Ishmael came to Notre Dame. You knew he was going to be great because he was fast. He could turn out the light and get in bed before it got dark. I, I mean, just a... <laughs> and I loved to watch Ryan... I loved to watch uh, Rocket Ishmael play tennis because he played by himself. And, and I mean, 
Well, Ryan Brewer arrived on campus, and we watched him run the 40-yard dash. I exaggerate not. He's one of the slowest players I'd ever seen. I was willing to bet anybody if Ryan Brewer got in a race with a pregnant mother, he would finish third. <laughs> the guy couldn't run. But he believed in himself. See, ladies and gentlemen, you can succeed when nobody else believes in you. You have no chance to succeed if you don't believe in yourself. Ryan Brewer believed he could made, play major college football, and all he wanted was a chance to do so. And that young man that nobody wanted, we went from 0-11 to the second largest turnaround in the history of the NCAA the following year. We're nationally ranked. We play Ohio State in a bowl game on January 1. The young man that nobody wanted rushed for over 100 yards. Caught pass for over 100 yards, scored three touchdowns, was the most valuable player in the football game. The following year, we played Ohio State again and beat him again. He averaged 13 yards a carry. See, ladies and gentlemen, his attitude was, hey, I can do it. Just give me a chance. I'm not asking for anything easy. I'm not asking for any special favors. All I'm saying is let me prove to you how good I can be. And I gave him the opportunity, and I learned a valuable lesson. The attitude of somebody is so much more important than talent. What you're capable of doing is determined by the amount of talent God gave you. How well you do something is determined by your motivation or whether you do something. But how well you do something is determined by your attitude. What's your attitude when people say negative things? Several years ago, we took Notre Dame down to New Orleans to play Florida in the Sugar Bowl. They had a great football team. Now, we were an underdog, but I felt we would win because of the attitude of our team, which we did. And on December 23rd, I sent our football team home for two days. I took my wife and my four children. We went to Orlando. Now, we have four children. They're all girls but two, and I'm real proud of that fact. And <laughs> we went out to dinner, and I'm never happier than when I'm with my family. And a waiter came up, and he recognized me. He said, you're Lou Holtz, head coach of Notre Dame, aren't you? And I said, yes, sir. And I took out my pen thinking he wanted an autograph. He said, let me ask you a question. He said, what's the difference between Notre Dame and Cheerios? I said, I don't have a clue. He said, well, Cheerios belong in a bowl, Notre Dame doesn't. <laughs> I, I'm here to tell you, my attitude changed now. I, 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 I wasn't a very happy camper, and I'm grumbling, mumbling. Finally, my wife said, you're going to let somebody you never met before, never going to see again, ruin an evening with your family? She said, you're smarter than that. You can't let somebody else that doesn't care about you control your happiness. I said, honey, you're so right. That's why I love you. You're so smart. And so I called the old young man back over, and I had a smile. I said, son, let me ask you a question. I said, what's the difference between Lou Holtz and a golf pro? And he said, I don't have a clue. I said, a golf pro gives tips. You know, she... <laughs> we can't let anybody else determine our attitude. And... But I could talk forever. But the attitude you have towards challenges, et cetera, is by far the most important thing in your organization. And associate yourself with people with the proper attitude also. The second point is you have to have a passion to win. You have to have a passion to succeed. I don't ask our athletes how many want to win. Everybody wants to win when the band's playing, the crowd's cheering, the TV lights are on. question I ask, can you live with losing? Can you live with failure? Can you live with mediocrity? Because if you can, that's what exactly what you're going to get. And I love to be around successful people. I know this right now about Bob and his lovely wife, the sacrifices they've made. Because you cannot be successful without sacrifice. There's no way possible. See, ladies and gentlemen, you show me a successful parent, a successful spouse. You show me a successful express personnel service people person. I listen to you call out the winners and wars. You know what I was thinking immediately? I know the sacrifice those people had to make to win because you cannot succeed without sacrifice. Losers call it punishment. You know, I'm one of these crazy people talk on the elevator. I'm on the elevator 6 o'clock in the morning. Cute young lady got on. She had a jogging outfit. I said, how far are you going to run today? She said, six miles. And I said, wow, I don't even drive that far. She said, do you jog? I said, oh, no, I want to be sick when I die. But 
I admire the sacrifice people make. She didn't say, well, how do you stay so skinny? I said, I can't eat when the Cubs lose. I think that's 50 something. But the sacrifice people make. And you know, you're at this meeting. You're at this meeting this wonderful where you get a chance to learn, exchange ideas, solve problems, and your enthusiasm great. But when you get back and things get difficult and everybody starts coming in and your job is 24-7 and I read where Bob said in an interview, well, yeah, you can be successful. You're willing to work an 80-hour week. I know, but you must understand or sacrifice. A few years ago at Notre Dame, we played the University of Michigan, our opening game, coached by Bo Schembecker. I knew it would be a good game. We'd have to play well. So when the team reported, I talked about how we had to make the maximum use of every minute on the practice field. The first couple of days was great. They had enthusiasm, excitement, yeah. Then they got tired, they got sore, and they, I became their enemy. They didn't care about Michigan. They cared about the fact they were uncomfortable and they were tired. And we weren't getting a bit better. They were going through the motions. You could go out there and practice them two days, and you weren't going to be any better. So finally, I walked out one day, and I called the um, team up, and I said, man, I called Bo Schembeck today, the coach at Michigan. Now, I didn't call Bo, but I said I did. I said, man, I called Bo. And I said, Bo, your Michigan player's tired? He said, yeah. I said, Bo, we're tired too. Tell you what, Bo, you give Michigan players a day off, I'm going to give Notre Dame players a day off. Our players started high-fiving one another and cheering. I looked at him, I said, Bo said no. <laughs> Bo doesn't care how tired you are. He's going to practice two hours. I don't want to practice you, but if we're going to beat Michigan, we have to practice two and a half. Took us three hours, but we had two and a half hours of good practice. Worked so well that day, I walked out the next day, I called my mom and said, hey man, I called Bo today. And he looked at me real funny and said, what Bo say? <laughs> I said, Bo, your players beat up and sore? He said, yeah. I said, I'll tell you what, Bo, you practice Michigan in shorts, I'll practice Notre Dame in shorts. I said, man, you ain't going to believe this. Bo said, no. Bo doesn't care how sore you are, you go to scrimmage. I don't want to scrimmage, I feel your pain, but if we're going to beat Michigan, we have to scrimmage. And don't get mad at me, but you remember this when you see Bo on September 12th, that's guy doing, not me. <laughs> I did a four straight day saying I called Bo. Walked out the fifth day before I could say a word, one of our players said, hey coach, I called Bo today. <laughs> I said, what Bo say? He said, Bo said his players eat steak and lobster, you know, but... <laughs> but it's just understanding the challenges you have. And so number one, you're going to make sacrifices. The second thing, if you have a passion to win, you're going to get rid of all the excuses why you can't. You know, ladies and gentlemen, coming into Oklahoma, I couldn't help but refer back to 1977 before most of you were born. I was coaching at the University of Arkansas, and we were getting ready to play Oklahoma in the Orange Bowl. Oklahoma at the time we played them would be number one. Had a great football team, had a great tradition. The last time Oklahoma had played Arkansas was in the early 20s when Oklahoma had beaten them 106 to nothing. And so this game was very, very important to the Arkansas people. But unfortunately, I had to suspend three athletes and scored 78% of our touchdowns. I had to suspend them because they violated the do-right rule. I won't go into it this time, but there was no way they were going to play. Everybody got upset, et cetera, and we went down to play Oklahoma. We were 24-point underdog in that game, and if you watched our team practice, you saw a negative football team. I want to compliment, when I was talking to Therese and Linda and Bob and talking about the group, they had nothing but great things to say about you. And this is a very positive group, an upbeat group. You say, how do you know that? I listen to you talk during lunch. I see how you laugh, how you're not. Well, our football team, when they're negative, they, they're so uncomfortable. They'd come into a meeting room, they wouldn't talk to one another, they wouldn't look at one another, they wouldn't look at me, and I couldn't get them to laugh. And I finally said to them, this four days before the game, I said, men, I know all the reasons why we can't win. I read about the great players from Oklahoma going to play every day in the paper. I read about the great players from Arkansas that aren't going to play. But I've never read one positive comment about anybody on this team in this room, so I know why we can't win. I don't want you to tell me why we can't win. What I want you to tell me is why we can. Nobody said anything for a while. Finally, a young man got up. He said, Coach, we have the number one defense in the country, which we did. He said, so we aren't going to get beat near as bad as everybody thinks. Well, <laughs> it, it wasn't what I wanted, but it was a step in the right direction. 
Then they point out we had a great punter, we had a great place kicker, we had, we had a great competitor quarterback, we had a great offensive line. I wanted to say they had a great coach. That, that never came up, but <laughs> when they left that room, it was a different team. Why? They focused on what they had, stop focusing on what we don't have. So many times we have a problem or difficulty, we stop focusing on the assets and the talents and the abilities and the opportunity. We start looking at problems and difficulties. And I could talk forever about a passion to win. But it leads me to point number three. Stay focused on what you're doing. Stay focused on what you're doing. I've read everything I possibly could about this excellent company. And by you go back to the founding of it. And the whole purpose of this entire company is to help people. You're trying to help people, and that's why you've been so successful. You've helped 369, 67,000 people get a job, but you're helping employees. You're, why are you successful? Why have you had tremendous growth? Why is it anticipated, I think, 21% this coming year? Why? Because you're helping people get what they want. See, ladies and gentlemen, it's not very complicated. I'm not very smart. But all I try to do is use common sense. The only way I've been able to get by is I'm not smart. I went to school basically eat my lunch, no other reason. But <laughs> when in doubt, I've used common sense. First time I remember using it was in the seventh grade. I had a nun named Sister Mary Harriet. She didn't like me, didn't think I was very smart, passed out a test, a big test one day. And I didn't know many answers, so I finished before everybody else because most of my paper is blank. And I started looking around out of boredom. I wasn't going to cheat. I, I wear glass. I couldn't see anyway. And she hollered in front of the whole class. She said, Lou Holtz, don't you even think about cheating. She said, if I even suspect you're cheating, I'm taking 10% off your grade. I got out the textbook, and I said, 90 sounds good to me. <laughs> but let's use common sense. All you're doing is you're finding out the problems people have and showing them how you can help solve it better than anybody else can. And ladies and gentlemen, if you're going to help people solve problems, it takes teamwork. You have to work together. The University of South Carolina, after we went on 11, it was about June, tw or July, uh, January 28th. I said to our football team, I want you to meet me in the stadium at 10.30 and bring your workout gear. That's all I said. And our stadium seated at an 80,000-seat stadium. January 28th, it's completely empty, but I had the lights on. And we averaged 82,000 the six years I was there. Had great fan support, but there's nothing more eerie than a beautiful big stadium empty at night. The players came out, and they weren't real happy. They didn't know what I wanted. Had a huge rope. I said, give me the 15 strongest defensive players. Give me the 15 strongest offense. They immediately started a tug of war. And the offense started to win. And pretty soon the defense started to win. And the defense started to win because I looked over. They didn't have 15. They had 18, 20, and then pretty soon they had the whole team. All the defense here, all the offense there involved in a huge tug of war, grunting and groaning, and finally the offense won. And they gave me, yeah, 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 we won. And I said, we can't win when we pull against each other. The only chance we have is if we pull for each other and with each other. Think how powerful we could be if we stopped pulling against each other. I proceeded to sit the team down and talk to them about teamwork. The speech that I'd worked on and prepared, I'm not going to cover all the points, but let me cover some of the major points I covered. Point number one, we need each other. We absolutely need each other. Let's understand that. There's all kinds of Hall of Fames. Football, basketball, actors, Italian-American Hall of Fame, but I've never seen a monument built to a team. But I've never seen anybody achieve anything by themselves. So let's understand we need one another. What a team enables you to do is accomplish things that no individual, regardless how multi-talented he may be, can do by himself. So let's understand we need the offense, the defense, the kicking game. Let's understand you need management. You need the people in your office. You need the employers. You need the help. We need each other. We must work together. That's number one. Point number two, our overall goal is to succeed. 
And you're going to have a role to help us achieve this overall goal. And I want to say this to you, ladies and gentlemen. As I said to our football team, you may not like your role. But all I want you to understand is everybody has a role, and that role is critical. If we didn't need that role to help us win, we wouldn't have it. Your role may be a backup left guard. You may not like that. But that is important because whether you like your role or not, our overall goal is more important because all the hopes and ambitions of everybody rides with this overall goal. And I can't let one individual being unhappy with his role ruin it. You may not want to succeed, that's fine, but you don't have the right to cause other people to fail because you don't fulfill your role. Point number three is the challenge escalates. The need for teamwork must elevate. I didn't need teamwork to go 0-11. If you need teamwork when you play. In Notre Dame, we played Michigan, Ohio State, Southern Cal, University of Texas, I mean Tennessee. People said, how do you sleep when you look at that schedule? I said, like a baby. Woke up every two hours and cried. I thought, oh, gee. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, as a challenge escalates, you must elevate teamwork. Point number four, the team must improve. There's three ways to improve a team. Number one, you add people. You go out, you recruit good people. You strengthen the team by adding good people. You also can strengthen the team on occasion by deleting bad people. Who are the bad people? They're the ones always bitching, moaning, complaining about everything and never have a positive suggestion. You will improve the team if you get rid of that person. But the most important way that team can improve is everybody on that team should be better today than they were yesterday, but not as good as you'll be tomorrow. See, ladies and gentlemen, the way the team improves is to get better. You just think you should be better today than you were yesterday and better tomorrow than you were today and how you do your jobs. And that's what's great about this convention, being able to interact and network and ask questions and find out how successful people handle the problems you have because you all have the same problems. I go to a coaching convention. I never wanted to talk. I wanted to ask questions because that's how you learn. But that's how the team improves. It doesn't have a thing to do with age. At age 84, Winston Churchill's in the House of Commons after serving as prime minister two different times. The reporter came up to him on his 84th birthday and said, Happy 84th birthday, Mr. Churchill. He said, Do you think I get a chance to wish you a happy 100th? He said, I think so. You look pretty healthy to me. You know, it's that mentality of trying to get better. And the fifth thing about teamwork, you can't have a weak link. You can't have a weak person outside in sales or a weak person inside. And you can't have weak training for your people, etc. See, ladies and gentlemen, number six is everybody on the team has to pay a price. You can't have three or four people pay the price for everybody else. These were just some of the things I talked to our team about, about teamwork. And six months later, we're nationally ranked. But we went from 0-11, as I said, I think, to 9-3. and 3. But it's just about teamwork. If I, our purpose is we could not win if we didn't have teamwork. You can't satisfy the needs of the customers if you don't have teamwork. The other thing I know about this, if you're going to satisfy the needs of the people, you must embrace change. You have to embrace change. And most people fight change. I would love to sit down, Bob, and ask you about all the changes that have happened in this organization since 1983 and all the different things with the, with the various uh, computerized age we live in, all the different changes, the way you do different things. It's change. Embrace change as long as you're changing to meet the needs of the people. I don't know why it is people fight change. Basically, nobody likes change. I didn't like change. I didn't want to throw the football. I wanted to run the football. Because I learned that from Bud Wilkes, and it isn't hard to run the football. Barry Switzer, you take the ball, and you turn, and you hand it to a great running back at Notre Dame named Ricky Waters or Jerome Bettis. That isn't hard. Anybody can do it. I can do it. Bob can do it. She can do it. She can do it. Hey, she can do it. Anybody can do it. That's not hard. But to throw the football, that's hard. Got to drop back, protect the pass, or run the route, read the cover. So that's hard. So I went to South Carolina and said, we're going to run the football. I believe in running the football. Well, the quarterback took the ball, and Hand it, Ricky Waters and Jerome Bettis wasn't there. And the guy who was there didn't want the ball. 
and we went on 11. So we had to change. Did I want to change? No, but we had to. Why did we change? Because we could not win if we didn't change it. That was one of our purposes. Why did we move study hall from a classroom where everybody felt like they were in jail and dumb to the library? Because it would enable us to graduate better. Why? Because there's one way in, there's one way out. Where do the good students go study the library? Where do the girls go the library? Where are the computers in the library? Every change I made was made to either graduate or win. That was it. Every change you make should be made, will this help us satisfy our customers and clients better? And embrace it. Do you realize in 1878 they invented the typewriter? The problem you have with the typewriter is if you type too fast, the key stuck. I said, we'll never sell a typewriter if the keys stick. So he put together a committee to figure out how to keep the keys from sticking. The committee came back after a reasonable enough time so we can keep the keys from sticking. The guy said, that's marvelous. How'd you get it to type faster? He said, we can't do that, but we can get it to type slower. He said, well, how's that? He said, we're going to hide the letters on the keypad. We'll put A up here. We'll put B down there. We'll hide C up there. We'll put Q over here and R over there, and nobody's going to be able to type fast. going to have to hunt. They're going to have to pack. Now, why, why they put that thing there? Didn't you wonder why the letters on the keypad are screwed up? That's so you couldn't type fast. <laughs> now, today, no matter how fast you type, the keys won't stick. If you try to change the letters on the keypad, no, don't change that, see, because I know that. I'm familiar with that. See, ladies and gentlemen, embrace change. I could talk forever about it, but... You look at the top Fortune 500 companies 50 years ago. Look at the top Fortune 500 today. Not many are on the same list. Why? Because people's needs change, and people don't always change to meet the needs of the people. You look at it in so many different areas. You look at the cost of health care and the lack of loyalty that people have to corporations, et cetera, that more and more people need you and all the wonderful opportunities. You have to make changes also, I would understand. I'm not trying to pretend I know how to do your job. Because I understand it at one time. You had a lot of help workers available. Few jobs, and now we've moved where there's a lot of jobs and maybe fewer workers. That all involves change. But embrace it. But don't ever lose sight of what you're trying to do. You aren't running an express personnel service. You're helping people. Point number four, be a dreamer. I want to congratulate Bob, his lovely wife, William, James, for being a dreamer, for having a vision. I'm sorry I did not get a chance to listen to his talk this morning, but I asked Bob, I said, tell me what he covered this morning. And he said he talked about dreams, talked about a vision, about where you're going. I believe that. I have a vision. Things happen when you have a dream. Martin Luther King made one of the ten greatest speeches known in the history of mankind. One of them was Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, John F. Kennedy's. That's not what this country can do for you, but what you can do for your country was one. Also, I think it was Winston Churchill, never so many owed so much to so few, was one. And also it was Martin Luther King, where he stood up in front of hundreds of thousands of people. He made his famous speech. He said, I have a dream. It motivated people and inspired people and changed this country for the better. One man had a dream. He had a dream, and he talked about, I have a dream. And in all due respect to Martin Luther King, let me ask you, do you think his speech would have had the same effect? And Martin Luther King stood up and said, I have a strategic plan I want to show you. Strategic plans don't excite anybody. Dreams do. Look at me. I'm five foot ten, 152 pounds, wear glasses, speak with a lisp. Have a physique that appears like I've been afflicted with berry, berry, and scurvy most of my life. <laughs> when I get out of high school, I never had a dream. All I wanted was a car, a girl, a job, and a million, five dollars. I'd never had any of them. Nobody from our family had ever gone to college. My high school coach came up, told my parents I should go to college be a coach. My mom decided she would go to work as the next rate. My wife, my mother would go to work as a nurse's aide, working 11 to 7 to send me to college financially. I didn't have a scholarship. And I said, no, I'm not going to college. My mom and dad said, you are. I said, I'm not. They said, you are. So we compromised, and I went. 
that was a typical compromise in our family. So I never had any dream just going along. And I go to the University of South Carolina under Marvin Bass, an assistant coach. My wife's eight months pregnant with our third child. We spent every cent we had in the bank for down payment on the home. I am there one month. One month. I get up on a Monday morning, the headline of the paper reads, Marvin Bass resigns. I said to my wife, I wonder if he's related to my coach. <laughs> All of a sudden, I find out I'm unemployed, Thomas F. Jones. He said, I'm going to hire Paul D. so he can pick his own staff. And I didn't know anybody in South Carolina to recommend me. I didn't know Paul D. or anybody on his staff, so I was not retained. I was unemployed. And after my wife gave birth to Kevin, who's now a lawyer, he graduated from Notre Dame Law School. I said, what's the most important thing you learned in law school? He said, the most important thing I learned was my first year. The professor told me to always remember this. If somebody's going to go to jail, make sure it's your client, not you. I said, that's good advice. Hey, well, <laughs> after she gave birth to Kevin, my wife went to work as an X-ray technician, which was her profession which is probably where the cancer came because they didn't get behind a curtain then, et cetera. I was a stay-at-home dad. I was a stay-at-home dad and feeling defeated. My wife bought me a book. And the only thing that was going to change it from where you are today to where you'd be five years from now are the books you read, the people you meet, and the dreams you dream. So the children were taking a nap, and I just thumbing through it. He talked about having some goals. And he suggested get out a piece of paper and write down five columns, which I did. Column number one was things I wanted to do as a husband and a father. All four of our children graduated from college. I've been married to my lovely wife for 45 years. Column number two was things I want to do religiously. God's very important in my life. I don't preach it. I don't lecture it. But I hope the way I live my life reflects the faith I have in God. That's why it was so gratifying to see the Christian principles that this company was built upon. I love what St. Augustine said. He said, you ought to preach the gospel 24 hours a day. And when absolutely necessary, even resort to using words. I said, that's pretty good. Column number three was things I wanted to accomplish financially. Column number four was things I wanted to do professionally. I wanted to coach at Notre Dame, wanted to win a national championship, etc. Column number five was things I wanted to do for excitement. I'm sitting there, what do I do? First thing I put down was I wanted to jump out of an airplane. Because I was an officer in the Army, and I was at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, the home of the 101st Screaming Eagle, and they're always jumping out of an airplane. Yeah. Then I wanted to land on an aircraft carrier. And I wanted to go on a submarine. And I wanted to be on the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. I wanted to go whitewater rafting on the Snake River for four days and three nights. I wanted to learn how to do magic. I wanted to make a hole-in-one. I wanted to play the greatest golf course in the world. I wanted to go to the White House for dinner. I wanted to visit with the Pope. Want to go to Pamplona and run with the bulls with a slower person? You know. <laughs> I had him down. My wife come home. I am so excited. I said, honey, I wrote down 107 things. We're going to do them all. And I'll never forget my wife looked at him and said, gee, this is great. She said, but why don't we get a job? So <laughs> we made it 108. Now there's 108. We've done 102. I've done everything I mentioned except run with the bulls, although my son ran with them last year. I know what it's like to come out of an airplane at 10,000 feet, free fall 5,000 feet in 45 seconds, pull the chute and fall the other 5,000 feet in seven and a half minutes. I ain't never going to do it again. <laughs> but later today when I fly out and we get up 10,000 feet and I look out that window, I remember what it's like. I can remember when they opened that door at 10,000 feet and the wind's howling, the engine's roaring. I think of the three people who pushed me out. <laughs> but don't go through life and be a spectator, be a participant. Dreams make things happen. You have to have a vision where you want to go. But don't make the mistake I made. I've done a lot of dumb things. There isn't anything I regret except one thing. Went to the University of Notre Dame. We took program on the bottom. Miami beaten them 58 to 6 in the last game preceding the year of my arrival. And I went to the University of Notre Dame and we took the program to the top. For nine straight years, we went to a January 1 bowl, sugar, cotton, orange, or fiesta. Nobody's done it before, nobody's done it since. 
We took it to the top and we kept it there. We maintained it. And it's a thing I truly regret in my life that we maintained it there. See, ladies and gentlemen, when I left the University of Notre Dame, I never thought I'd coach again. Where do you go from Notre Dame, according to my mother, except you go directly to heaven and you sit by the Pope? <laughs> and then I went and I do TV work. And let me tell you something about TV. That isn't real hard. On TV, you just talk to you, think of something to say. <laughs> then I went to live in a town where the average age is deceased. <laughs> and what I found out when I had that same empty feeling, what it was, I wasn't tired of coaching. I was tired of maintaining. There's a rule of life that said you're either growing or you're dying. The tree's either growing or it's dying. So's grass. So's a business. So's a marriage. But so's a person. And you know what happens? You get successful, ladies and gentlemen. And you get there and you say, you know, this is pretty good. Let's not risk it. Let's not take any chance. Let's jeopardize it. Let's not create any problems. Let's not have any more disappointments. Let's not have any more heartaches. Let's keep it here. And anytime you try to maintain something, ladies and gentlemen, you're dying. You stop being the hunter and you become the hunted. What we should have done was set goals and standards nobody thought was possible. But anytime you try to maintain, you never have a reason to celebrate. You never have a reason to get excited. And so that's why I went to the University of South Carolina. They'd won one bowl game in 108 year history, been nationally ranked one time. And it was exciting. You know what, ladies and gentlemen, you have to have four things in your life. Everybody has to have four things in your life. One, you have to have something to do. Number two, you have to have someone to love. Number three, you have to have someone to believe in. Number four, you have to have something to hope for. If you don't have all four of those things in your life, I guarantee you there's a void. And when you try to maintain, you never had anything to hope for. And that is absolutely disastrous. That's why dreams are so important. You know, ladies and gentlemen, I could talk forever about that. But let me go to point number five. How do we create an environment where everybody lifts each other up and doesn't pull each other down? I've taken over six college situations, never inherited a winner. Never failed to go to a bowl game by the second year at the latest. And what I found out in every losing situation... We had a group of people who were so insecure, they're always criticizing everybody else, trying to pull them down so they'll feel better by comparison. You want to create an environment where people are confident and lift each other up. I used to be very, very insecure, and I don't say this proudly, but maybe you'll benefit from it. I used to be insanely jealous of my wife. And in 45 years of marriage, not one single time did she ever give me a reason to be jealous, not once. The problem wasn't with her, it was with me. If we went to a cocktail party and she'd be talking to another man, he'd always be better looking, better built, more intelligent, and I'd think, why wouldn't she rather be with him than with me? And because of my insecurity, I would criticize my wife trying to pull her self-confidence down till she'd reach a level where she would think she was lucky to have me. See, that's what insecure people do. That's what people have floundered. That's what people have jumped from one fad to the other that don't really have a plan of how you handle people, how you deal with people, how you get the most out of people. And every time you're not getting a lot out, it's because everybody's pulling each other down. How do we turn it around? Three rules. I only have three rules for my children, three rules for myself, three rules for our football team. There are three rules, and they're simple. Rule number one is what I call do right. Do what's right and avoid what's wrong. If you have any doubt, get out the Bible. I can tell you what I think's right. I think it's right to be honest, right to be on time, right to be loyal. I think it's wrong to practice racism, sexism, spousal abuse. I think it's wrong to feel guilty. There's not an individual in this room, myself included, hadn't done dumb things, wish he hadn't done them. But you can't go through life with an albatross around your neck saying, I made a bad mistake. All you can do is say you're sorry, make amends, and move on. Don't dwell on the mistakes. Happiness is nothing more than having a poor memory. <laughs> you can't remember what happened yesterday. You feel good today. <laughs> you also, I think it's wrong to be bitter. We've all had injustices done. You can't go through life being bitter about something that happened. You know, because when you're bitter, you're negative. 
How many times we see the person growing old being bitter about something that happened 20 years ago and they passed away, their spouse has to hire pallbearers? Just do the right thing. <laughs> Second rule, do everything to the very best of your ability. I am not going to allow you to be mediocre. I coach for Woody Hayes. I loved Woody Hayes. I don't tolerate it. I don't believe or condone everything he did, but I'll tell you this. But I learned from Woody Hayes, if you're in a leadership role, which you are, you cannot worry about being popular. If you're a parent, you can't worry about whether they like you. You can't worry about whether your employees like you. Your obligation is to make them the very best they possibly can be. And if you're going to worry about being popular, you're not going to want to have standards. I had one standard, one rule. I want you to be the very best you possibly could in the classroom and on the football field, period. I just want you to do the very best you can. What's the difference between athletes today and when I started in coaching? Same difference I see in society. Today, everybody wants to talk about their rights and their privileges. When I got into coaching, people talked about their obligations and their responsibilities. And one of these old-fashioned people believe you join a spouse, you bring a child to work, you go to work for somebody, you join an organization. You have obligation responsibilities. You may want to fail, that's fine. You don't have the right to cause other people to fail. So I expect you to do everything to the very best of your ability. Rule number three, I expect you to show people you care. Genuinely reach out and show people you care. Ladies and gentlemen, you're smarter than I am. You come up with a million different ways to show people you care, and it doesn't have to be expensive. I said I was a graduate assistant way back when, when I started coaching. One of my obligations, in addition to coaching football, was 15 hours a week I taught physical education to the physically handicapped children. Children with spinal bifida, nothing from the waist down. Children that had cerebral palsy, muscular dystrophy. When I see people like that, and then I see people with talent and ability and opportunity bitching and moaning and complaining about something, it drives me crazy. How lucky we are. And I want to congratulate the people who went down for the express personnel service people who were wiped out in Katrina. I understand several of you on your own went down to help. Magnificent. What you people have done with the Children's Miracle Network, all the different things you have done to help people. My wife, as I said, had cancer, stage four. And she goes up to the Mayo Clinic March 1st again. She goes a couple times a year. Last time she went was a couple months ago. And the test started at 7 o'clock in the morning, so she had to go up the night before. And I go back to bed quite late. And there on my pillow is a little note from my wife. Now here's a young lady that's going up to find out if cancer's in remission. I can only imagine what must be going through her mind on the way up there. And yet she was worried whether I was going to sleep well and told me what she'd prepared for breakfast. I said, a little note. didn't take her five minutes to write that. It meant volumes. My wife always looked at When I was at 10 o'clock every night, local time, 10 o'clock at night, if I'm not at home, I'm going to think of my wife. She's going to think of me, if at all possible. When I would be gone an awful lot in recruiting, we had four little children. She made the children keep a diary. I would come home. I'd sit down with each child. We would go over that diary. I want to know what they did in school, how they did in sports, what was the, how they do with their chores, what was the most exciting thing that happened, what's the most disappointing. Why is that important? So that they knew you cared. That's all people want to know. Do you care? So those three rules. Do the right thing. Do the best you can. Show people you care. Why are those three rules important? Because you have to ask three questions about everybody you deal with, the same three questions they're going to ask about you. I know you're in several different countries. I understand it. I don't care what country you're in. These are the three universal questions every spouse asks each other, every athlete. The three questions everybody asks subconsciously. Question number one, can I trust you? Can I trust you? My wife and I are completely opposite. My wife said, opposites attract and then attack. <laughs> we are different, but we've been married 45 years for one major reason, beside the fact I love her dearly. She can trust me explicitly, and I can trust her. I would never betray the trust of my wife, because once you lose that trust, you can't get it back. Everything's based on trust. All relationships based on trust. 
How do you get trust? Both sides do the right thing. South Carolina, my first year after we had gone, 0 and 11. On about June the 12th, I had two players arrested for drugs who had been on the preceding team. They weren't on that team. But two players on last year's team were selling for drugs. I was so mad. And all the players were in summer school. They ate at 6 o'clock. I said, I want a team meeting at 7. And I was so mad. I was so irate. I want to know why they didn't trust me. Why didn't you trust me to tell me this? Why? I was irate. Nobody said anything. Finally, a sophomore got up and said, I trust you, coach. And he said, I think the team trusts you. But I'll never forget, he looked around the room and said, a lot of my teammates I don't trust. A lot of you lie and cheat and steal. The problem with that football team, they didn't trust each other. Why? Because they didn't do the right thing. They had them write up a piece of paper of things they didn't like about themselves they couldn't change, put an X in it. Column number two, things they didn't like about themselves they're going to change. Column number three, everything they regret they ever did wrong. And I said it would be confidential. Gave them the next day till 2 o'clock, took them out to the practice field. South Carolina had a tradition, whenever they won a big game on the road, they put a little tombstone. Date, name, opponent, score. It wasn't a very big graveyard. There were just a couple of them. <laughs> we went out there. I dug a hole. I had a tombstone this big blank. We dug a hole, put every one of those papers in, burned it, covered it up with dirt, put the tombstone there for everybody to see every day they went to practice. They knew from that time on they would never again lose a trust to their teammates. Six months later, we're nationally ranked. Trust is so critical. Boy, my time's rapidly running down. But just let me say this. Do the right thing. People can trust you. The second question everybody asks, are you committed to excellence? Do you want to be good? That's what you ask about your people. They ask about you. That's what the employers ask about you. You can have all the slogans you want. You send a message whether you're committed to excellence by your commitment. When I was coaching, if I made a speech, I went to a staff meeting. I was better prepared than any member of my staff. And I had a great staff. But why was that important? Because if I didn't, I'd say, hey, coach, you have a good time at Oklahoma City? Did you go to the banquet? Did you dance? Did you play golf? That's why when I walked into a staff meeting, they had to know that football was the most important thing on my mind, even though I was traveling. The question, are you committed to excellence, can only be answered if you do everything to the best of your ability. The last question everybody wants to ask, do you care about me? Do you care about me because I can run or throw? Do you genuinely care what happens to me if the person you send doesn't show up? Do you understand what happened to my company if the person you send is not honest? Or I, it's so simple. You've got to have people that genuinely care about each other. You know, ladies and gentlemen, my time's up. I think I have about a minute and a half to two minutes. But I, I just want to say this. If you do the right thing, people can trust you. If you do it to the best of your ability, they know you're committed to excellence. And if you show people you care, that will always answer that. There isn't any such thing as magic. As I said, that was one of my goals. I'd like to do a simple little trick for you. Not a real complicated trick. It's like any other newspaper. You have front page, people want to read news, you're on Bettis. You have the comics for people can't read. And you always have the editorial page for people can't think. But... I always put those three questions on everybody. Every athlete twice a year and then sit down and talk to them. I want you to take somebody you admire and respect, somebody you love on your team. I want you to take somebody you got a problem with. This could be in your personal life, could be in your professional life, could be in your social life. Put these three questions on both people, yes or no. Can you trust them, yes or no? Are they committed to excellence, yes or no? Do they care about you and the organization, yes or no? I guarantee you the person you admire and respect, you just said yes about all three questions. Person you got a problem with, you pinpointed the problem. Either you can't trust them, they aren't committed, or they don't care. Isn't magic and how you do it? Yeah. Yeah. Somebody said, how'd he do that? Perfectly, I thought, but in any event. I wake up middle night screaming because I can't figure it out either. But, <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, did everybody come to the University of Notre Dame, South Carolina, Arkansas, and said that you could trust we're committed to care? No. But I would sit down with them, and I expected to have a problem. I'd say, here's why I can't trust you, because you aren't doing the right thing, and I don't want to have this conversation again. Or here's why I don't believe you're doing the best you can, and I don't want to have this conversation. Or here's 
That's the way you'd want to be treated. Everything was based on those three rules. That was our core values. That's what we believed in. That's how we operated. Not very complicated, but that was our plan, ladies and gentlemen, those five things. Every time I followed the plan, we had great success. Sometimes I deviated from the plan, and when I did, it cost us. There was a time at one time where we had built a great program. Then you want to keep people happy. You start taking things for granted. You start cutting slack. You say, well, maybe I'm getting too old. Maybe I need to be hip hop. Maybe I need to be politically correct nonsense. Do the right thing. Do the best you can. Show people you care. I congratulate you on your success. What you've done has really been amazing. But I challenge you to do two things in this beautiful environment. Number one, congratulate yourself on what you've done. Being an entrepreneur is very, very important because you're, you are helping other people be successful. And that's just like coaching or being a parent. They're in a greater feeling than help other people be successful. But I also challenge in this beautiful environment to tell yourself, I'm going to get better in every phase of my life. I'm going to be a dreamer because, boy, that's exciting. I, I want to tell you, I'm so old now, I don't even buy green bananas. But I do dream. Thank you for having me.